Hi, I'm Jonas, uh, working for Eclipse Source. Uh, we are a company building tools and IDEs for our customers and supporting them in their project. Um, and in this talk, I would like to talk about migrating Eclipse-based tools and plugins to web-based platform like Thea or VS Code. You might have seen my previous talk today, uh, which covered a more generic topic, how to get started with web-based tools. And now this is kind of the continuation of that. Uh, specifically targeted at projects that already have an Eclipse-based uh, tool. Um, again, the reason for this talk, we, we currently uh, work a lot uh, in migration projects. Um, as I mentioned in the previous talk, kind of 80% of our current projects are building web-based tools, and a lot of those are traditionally migrating Eclipse-based solution to, to the web or and the cloud. And again, I would like to share experiences um, from these projects covering most important questions. Um, and if you attended my previous talk, uh, the same disclaimers kind of apply. So this is a 25 minutes talk. Um, we can only cover the tip of the iceberg, um, answer like the most important questions. But as before, I have references to more information um, to dive more in detail about specific topics. So let's get right into that. Um, so what is this talk about? Um, I assume you have some desktop tool based on Eclipse platform. It can be a full tool distribution or a plugin, and you now want to migrate that to the web or, or uh, to the cloud. Um, typically, that would be VS Code or Thea, but could also be something at like, like VS Codium or any other tool. Um, I don't really make a difference in, in, in this particular talk uh, what the target platform is. So the, the um, answers or information is more generic. Now. Um, Quickly, quick recap. I shown this slide before, but just uh, for the people who haven't attended my previous talk, um, the typical architecture of a of a web-based tool. What so? What's the target architecture we we want to fit our tool in? Um, web-based tool typically has a tool front end and a back end. So we have this split between two parts that we usually don't have on the desktop. Um, and now the the front end is written in HTML, uh, running in the browser en engine, the HTML plus CSS and JavaScript. And then the business logic of the tool runs in the backend that very often runs on Node.js, but also integrates other languages like Java, C, and so on. And now we, we kind of had to have to fit our tool features that we have on the desktop into the split architecture. Now it's worth uh, noting that uh, there are typically two deployment scenarios. One is if you deploy the front end and the backend separately, and the server at some remote location, you would have the cloud set up. Um, but you can also bundle those two things together, for example, with Electron, and then still deploy a desktop tool. Um, and that kind of leads to the first question, like if you migrate from an existing Eclipse-based tool, which, which is the more interesting option and what are the pros and cons? So let's quickly talk about that. So desktop versus online cloud um, variant. Now, uh, you might wonder, why do we even want to go to a desktop tool? Like, I mean, this is about web-based and cloud-based, so why do people even care about desktop tools anymore? It's actually, um, users get what they're used to. If if your current user base use, use a, a desktop tool, they might want to stick to that. Um, and uh, by migrating to a web-based platform, you can actually get modern rendering. So the UI will uh, be more modern. You have more capabilities in terms of uh, visualization in your tool. But you still have all the desktop features, like all full keyboard combinations. It's downloadable. You can, for example, connect it to uh, devices that are connected to the PC. Also possible in the browser, but easier with a desktop tool. And, and people basically can just download and install. And there are users who prefer to do that still, especially in the tool area. Um, obvious disadvantage is you still have this local setup. So people have to install the tool and potentially also install some pre-dependencies, uh, some, some prerequisites or dependencies of it, and which is the typical motivation then in turn to go for an online solution because you, you can have the setup uh, on the server and it's the same for all users. So it's much easier to uh, onboard new users because ideally they just have to access a URL. Um, you even have potential new business models. So you could host, uh, provide hosting services for your tool, sell the tool uh, as a service rather than like licenses. Um, and other things like, for example, if you're in an embedded area, you could uh, provide so-called device farms where people can actually select uh, different devices to deploy to in, in the cloud or in the data center or something like that. So a lot of new possibilities when moving to the cloud, but um, you should not underestimate the effort that uh, you have to spend for the infrastructure to host those cloud-based tools, because everything that was done on the PC of the developer 
you now have to do in, in the cloud, especially if you provide the hosting. And that is a significant effort for, for you as the provider. And that is true for the creation of this infrastructure, but also for the maintenance, because you actually run the developer workspaces uh, then, um, which poses some completely new challenges. Also sometimes forgotten, um, if you host uh, the, your tool as a provider that might conflict with security or IP governance um, restrictions that your clients might have. So they might not be able to just, pro for example, use your uh, online version and push the source code there uh, for security reasons or for governance reason. So that, mean, <clears throat> that means you might need even to provide an on-premise version of your cloud-based offering that clients can actually install on their cloud infrastructure, which poses additional effort on the solution, just to keep that in mind. It's worth note, noting that um, with this architecture that I just introduced, you can single source most tool features. Um, so you can develop in a way that you can deploy them on the desktop, but also in the cloud version. So that's a good thing. Um, and as a consequence, we can observe many vendors that follow a dual strategy. They aim at a web-based tool, like in this architecture on the desktop, still provided as a desktop tool. And then in parallel start to build up a cloud offering that they might even deploy later um, in time, uh, which is then the logical next step after this web-based desktop tool. And for example, VS Code did a similar thing. First, a desktop tool that was prepared to run in the cloud and then recently the online version of it. Um, talking about VS Code, the underlying code tool platform to choose, um, I mean, Thea is from the Eclipse ecosystem, might be a logical um, choice for you if you're coming from the Eclipse desktop version, but it's definitely worth comparing the two. Um, I will not talk about this in this uh, um, talk again. I briefly covered it in the previous talk, and there is an article that I wrote about this topic. This is a, a sophisticated decision. You will not be able to make this in five minutes. You really have to evaluate this properly. Um, so I, I recommend take some time. If you have specific questions about your, your project, feel also uh, free to talk to me during this conference at our booth or join one of our sessions where we can discuss your specific requirements in detail. Now, <clears throat> sorry. Now, um, next step, or kind of the first step when you actually start to prepare the migration of your um, existing tool um, to the web or the cloud, um, I strongly recommend to do some conceptual assessment first before you even uh, think about technology. This might sound boring, but migrating a tool to the web or the cloud is actually a major uh, implementation effort, no matter what you do, it will be some re-implementation of some parts of your tool. And before you actually do this, I, I think this is a good point in time to reassess some, some assumptions of your project before you actually rework it and before you spend a lot of effort on something that might not even ne be even necessary. And um, I would I want to highlight three specific areas where you should think about the, the current way your tool works. And the workflows, some workflows might not make sense uh, anymore in a cloud-based context. For example, if your existing desktop tool integrates the status of build servers, um, if you run that in a browser, you might just allow the user to open another tab that directly shows the UI of a build server without integrating that in your tool. And there are other parts of your tool that might com work completely different in the cloud uh, context. So I definitely recommend assessing all the workflows of your tool uh, with keeping in mind that they are now running in a new context. Second, often forgotten again, um, remove unnecessary features and don't migrate them. If you like statistics and surveys show that um, 50 up to even 80% of to, uh, the features of tools are almost never used. And before you have to re-implement them, you might decide to get rid of them and start with a more fresh, uh, reduced feature set, especially when you migrate. And, because it's a new tool, people, users might accept that there's something missing that they, they very occasionally use or, or maybe never use. And then third, um, redesign your user experience. So you will have more uh, freedom when you go to a web-based platform because it's a browser rendering engine, so you can do visually more sophisticated stuff. But also, if you look at the existing web-based tool, Thea and VS Code, they, they uh, follow a new paradigm in terms of usability. So it's, it goes away from like huge wizards where you can click a lot of stuff rather to keyboard focused, um, very efficient UX models. And I strongly recommend to look at them and maybe adapt them for your own tool because a lot of 
developers like in our days more a keyboard focused and maybe even CLI focused uh, user experience. All right. Um, in parallel, you should start to technically assess your Eclipse plugin. Um, what does that mean? So when you shift to the cloud, um, there are two uh, different things how, how you could or what to do with your existing features. Now, when we look at the uh, Eclipse tool or the Eclipse plugin, um, you typically have some UI part and some headless part. Now, the UI part, you very likely need to re-implement because as mentioned before, the UI of web-based tools is, is done in HTML and JavaScript and CSS. And the Eclipse tool is very likely done in, in SWT or AWT or Swing. Um, so you need to re-implement that. Um, however, um, if your tool contains some logic, like the headless part, you might be able to uh, reuse that and basically transfer, transfer it to the backend of your tool um, and then basically trigger it from within a new UI. Um, sounds very abstract. Um, and depending on the feature, it might make sense or not. So you really have to assess that for every part of your tool. In turn, if there are business logic parts where, there, where you spend many years or even decades of, in developing those, um, it might be of great benefit to migrate them, as, at least initially, and not just re-implement them from scratch, because this will add a very high effort on the uh, on your migration project. Now, let's look at three examples. How what does that mean in practice? So, first example would be a code generator. I think that's the best one of the best examples for a headless uh, piece of your tool. So, very often code generators are really, really a lot of effort or have been a lot of effort to implement. Um, so uh, definitely worth assessing to reuse them. Now, how to integrate them in, uh, on the backend then? Uh, that's maybe an interesting thing. So in those tool backends of web-based tools, you can very easily talk to dedicated processes. Even if the code generator is written in a language like C or Java or Python, you could just start this process from within the, the regular tool backend. Um, either via starting the process or maybe even using a command line interface to just trigger the code generator. So very thin layer of integration. Um, and you can then just reuse what you have, um, maybe adding a new UI for a code generator. The UI might be very small. Um, so you can actually save a lot of the existing investments. Um, next example would be a custom DSL, for example, done with Xtext. Um, so Custom DSLs or in general language support in web-based tools, you would use the language server protocol typically to implement them. Um, if you used Xtext, the good news is you can generate language service with Xtext too. If not, um, and you have another like a, a custom DSL or some custom logic, you might even consider to use the language server protocol for your desktop tool and switch to that uh, in parallel to migrating to the cloud because Eclipse, the desktop version, also supports um, the language server protocol. So you can actually then base the desktop tool and the new cloud-based or web-based tool on the same language server implementation. And finally, diagram editor, which typically involves a lot of UI. Um, there you really need to switch the UI implementation. So there's you cannot just migrate this, um, which requires some effort. There is uh, There are technologies to build diagram editors in the web, for example, Eclipse GLSP. And for the business logic around the diagram, for example, validating um, the diagram or comparing it or <clears throat> maybe triggering some analysis, you can actually then, um, again, integrate the business logic on the server if it makes sense. And for example, provide some custom interfaces like REST services and sockets on the server. Now, what this means in a nutshell, um, during this assessment, you basically find out what are the pieces of your existing tool that you want to reuse and what do you want to re-implement. And then um, typically I would re recommend to uh, adapt the architecture of your existing Eclipse plugin in a way that the parts that you want to reuse are already dedicated. So that means that the headless part is cleanly separated from the UI so that you can ideally um, continue to use them in the desktop tool but start to integrate them uh, in the cloud or web-based tool in parallel. And what this will enable you to do is um, it will lower the maintenance effort that you have to spend when uh, in the phase where you have the desktop tool and the new web-based tool in parallel. Because every line of code that you don't have to maintain twice um, will reduce the effort. So, And it really depends on the project, um, on how feasible this is. 
Um, again, for things like code generator, very obvious. For features that are very intertwined to UI, it might be better to, to rewrite them. Um, so it's really a custom for every project. Um, again, if you if you have a specific example and you want to to have an opinion about that, feel free to talk to to me or my colleagues. Um, now, when uh, migrating to to a web-based platform, um, we talked about the underlying platform, Theo VS Code, but you might require more technologies for other features. So let's look at an overview. Uh, on what is a typical replacement for something when you migrate uh, to a web-based version of your tool. Now, <clears throat> for the Eclipse platform, we already mentioned the most common choices are Thea or VS Code. Um, for the workbench, meaning the, um, the API to influence menus, views, um, all the stuff that is actually part, part of a typical Eclipse workbench, and both Thea and VS Code provide API for that. Thea actually provides the API for uh, that is provided by VS Code too. So in Thea, you actually have two different um, um, APIs to do something like that. Um, again, if you if you're interested in the details, I'll link the article here again. But that's the replacement of the Workbench API. Um, SWT and JFace are gone. I'm sorry, <laughs> no more SWT and JFace in the web. Um, you basically use um, what you would use in any web application. So it's HTML, JavaScript, TypeScript, um, but you can also use frameworks like React or Angular. I would say most common choice is currently React in, in the tool area. Not for all projects, but many, many use React for custom UIs essentially. Language support, um, any kind of language support. Um, the language server protocol that I mentioned before TextMate grammars for syntax highlighting, and the debug adapter protocol for debugging uh, support. Plus, there are custom extension API and contribution points, again, provided by VS Code and Thea. So very similar to the Eclipse uh, platform, there are there is API to enable more sophisticated language support. But um, the majority of that is provided by the language server protocol um, for code editing and the debug adapter protocol for debugging. Xtext, if you if you have a custom BSL, can we use that in the web to generate a language server then? If you have some custom UI parts, um, based on that, you need to rewrite and reintegrate them. Diagrams, uh, for example, done with GMF and GF. Um, there is the Eclipse graphical server platform that is very similar to uh, the language server protocol, but for diagram editors. Um, this is based on Sprotty and it's Eclipse project. So check it out if, if you want to build some web-based diagrams. Um, if you're using technology from the EMF ecosystem, there's a project called EMF Cloud that aims uh, at two things. First, um, make some parts of EMF uh, usable in the cloud um, because EMF has quite some headless parts, for example, the data model itself or the entities. Uh, for, ex or, for example, for EMF compare the comparison algorithm. So those there are parts you can reuse and there are some parts you need to re-implement or that you even have to add to the stack. And this is what EMF Cloud is targeted at. And finally, form-based UIs, or for example, if you're based on EMF forms, um, there's JSON forms, uh, the, the web version of that, essentially. Um, I want to highlight again, there is a public example that combines a lot of uh, these technologies to a example tool. Um, you can look at the sources um, to see how those different technologies can be combined with each other. And you can try this tool online to basically see what is currently possible uh, with web-based tools. And there's quite some documentation around it to adapt it. Um, and we have observed that quite a few projects have used this as a starting point or a Kickstarter to build a, a custom tool based on all those technologies. Um, there's a related question to this. Uh, so we discussed before um, the uh, underlying platform like VS Code and TIA extensions. And I mentioned that they both provide, uh, at least that TIA provides two APIs. And many projects, when they start to implement uh, um, the web-based version, struggle with the question, which of those two extension mechanisms to use? This is only valid if you build your tool uh, on Eclipse TIA. If, you're, if you build on VS Code, you basically have to choose VS Code extension because that's the only thing uh, supported there. 
Now, the background for this is um, so VS Code um, uh, provides this extension model. Um, it has uh, it allows you to add features to the tool. And those features work against a defined API. They run in a dedicated process. You can install them at runtime, and they can add some stuff to, to the existing tool. Um, it's very simple to write them, um, especially because the API is defined and, and well documented. However, they are limited um, to this API. So there are certain things that you cannot do with VS Code plugins. Now, Thea, in turn, um, is actually modular at its core. And that's due to the fact that Thea is actually um, built as a platform rather than a tool. So VS Code is a tool that you can extend, while Thea is meant as a platform to build tools upon it. And for that reason, Thea is actually modular in its core. And the module concept there is called Thea extension. Now, when you write a Thea extension, you can actually access all the internals of Thea, and you, you almost have no limits in what you can do. And now, as mentioned before, Thea also supports VS Code extensions. So when writing um, a tool based on Thea, you have both choices. Now, what to pick? Um, if you can simply do something with the code, VS Code extension, it's probably preferable to use that because um, it's very simple and you also implement the feature in a way that is also compatible to VS Code, which might be attractive for some projects. However, if uh, if you do something more complex that you cannot do with a VS Code extension, you can still switch to a Thea extension. There are some thin lines between, like for example, if you implement custom editors or custom views, um, you can do it with both, but it's actually more efficient with Thea extensions. So especially for custom UI, you might even choose Thea extensions for efficiency reasons, although you could do it with VS Code extensions. Now, I want to close with some hints on the strategy. Um, again, so migrating a tool to the web is a major endeavor. It's not so, like migrating from Eclipse 4.7 to 4.8. It's really, it will mean to rewrite um, large parts of your tool. Now, what are the most important things when defining a strategy? Um, I strongly recommend to spend time on evaluating the technology choices, starting from the platform, the Oasis VS Code, but also all other, other pieces, like um, everything that you make part of your new tool chain, spend some time to, to find out whether that's the right choice for you. Uh, we can give you some hints, and there are, there are articles around there, but you will probably stay on this architecture for the next five, 10, or even more years, um, so it will have an impact which technologies you choose. Um, to find that out, it helps to build POCs, proof of concepts, like small versions of your tool, they will prove that the technologies do what you want, and they will also help you to gain knowledge about the general architecture, but also about the technologies. Um, define MVPs. Try to build something minimal first and really go for the absolute minimal um, first iteration and not migrate everything at once, um, except if you have indefinite resources and you don't care about the cost. Uh, but this will allow you to control the risk and basically allow you to put something out there as soon as possible and get some feedback from your users. And then you can iterate that uh, on that again. And finally, go iteratively. So um, define a first minimal product, achieve that, learn from that, and then go again. I know that all those points are kind of truism for software projects, but I wanted to highlight them because, again, migrating to the web um, migrating an existing tool to the web or, or the cloud is a major endeavor. So it's it's comparable to rewriting it. Although, as mentioned, you might be able to reuse something, but still, it is a major technology shift. Um, so um, it's it's a good thing to apply those be best practices of software engineering. Right. Um, I'm happy to take any questions in a second. I would like to mention a few other sessions if you're interested in the topic. So today at uh, 5 p.m. we will have a spotlight session. That's an open session where you can ask questions. You can also ask questions specific to your project. I will be in the session with some of my colleagues. We will have a, a BOF session tomorrow at uh, quarter past six, uh, again, about this topic. You can talk to us at our booth uh, anytime and ask questions. And there are other sessions listed on the slide about building tools and some of the technologies I mentioned today. And with that, um, Thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take take your questions now. 
Yeah, let's look at the questions. Um, so first question, do you think migrating a customized Eclipse IDE mainly CDT to a Thea based product uh, today will already provide a mature development environment for C developers? Simple answer, yes, <laughs> there are products out there already. Um, some you can see uh, in the public, for example, the new Arduino IDE, uh, ARM Embed Studio, Kyle Studio, those are uh, projects that are available publicly. And I can tell you, I cannot tell you more details, but we have a couple of customers that build internal tools for C development based on Thea um, and on VS Code, and they are already in production. So it's definitely um, possible to do that. Um, and maybe to answer the question about CDT a bit, um, because they're like uh, embedded development is currently one of the strongest area when it comes to web-based tools. At least we can observe that from our customer base. And as every new project kind of have to find the new the the same technology choices and how to put things together, uh, we thought about how to address that. And I don't want to tell you the exact answer we have to that, but I recommend to join the talk tomorrow called CDT.cloud. Uh, it's tomorrow on this conference at 10 to 2, so um, uh, 1.50. Um, it's called CDT.cloud, C, C++ tooling in the web. Um, and uh, I think something like Blueprint was already mentioned in another question. So definitely join that. But the, the quick answer is actually yes. Um, second question would be, are there uh, concepts known from Eclipse like workspace projects, natures, builders, reusable on the server side? Um, not really. I mean, there there are typically equivalents um, for those concepts, but in general, um, Thea as well as VS Code, they're a little bit slimmer currently in terms of those concepts. You might claim less complex, um, but for example, um, yeah, you have to use sometimes different concepts and sometimes the concepts are missing. Um, there, I would claim we're currently in a state where some of the missing concepts are actually identified by people and then contributed. For example, in the CDT or C++ area, again, um, currently working um, in, in, the, in, the, in the working group, in the Clip Cloud Developer Working Group on some of those concepts. For example, the notion of a context for compilation that, that has been there in Eclipse before. Um, do I have to use TextMate for syntax highlighting? Or is there a way that I can use uh, the functionality from ELSP to do the highlighting? The standard way is to do uh, to use TextMate or Monarch for syntax highlighting, which is processed on the client then. And you can do additional highlighting wired LSP, which is usually uh, or which is actually meant for semantic highlighting. So to add some additional highlighting that is really based on semantic. And the idea is to have a split, like everything that is statically known um, should be done in TextMate and everything that that um, where you need some project knowledge uh, should be done by the language server. Um, do I need to refactor existing Workbench API calls to Thea API calls? Yes, simple answer, yes. The Workbench API is actually gone. Um, and I'm getting a signal here um, that we are running out of time. Um, what I can uh, propose to you, in 10 minutes, there is another session, session starting called Q&A Web-based tools. So it's, it's our spotlight session. I will be in the session and a couple of other uh, of my colleagues, and we just take questions for half an hour. So if you have uh, if you have any of those questions that I didn't answer, just join there, and we make sure we answer all your questions. And with that, thank you for attending, and hopefully see you in the next session. Thank you.